Stay tuned in this video because I'm going to be giving a shout out and a thank you to three subscribers. March is the most critical month in the beekeeping year. In the month of March, this is when most colonies will die and it's a result of starvation coming out of winter. It's a result of viruses that the mites have been uh, transferring during the winter. It also can be a result of a queen failure where you lost your queen during the winter or she's, if she hasn't failed, she's failing. She's not producing much brood. The colony is getting smaller and smaller. And also in the month of March, in most of the U.S., there's still a threat of cold weather. And if your colony has become small in numbers, that cold snap can take your colony out. Most people don't realize during the month of March, this is when a lot of the older bees of winter physiology start to weaken and die off. They don't have much more time left. And so the queen has started to pick up her laying a little bit. And that new brood is going to be the replacement of your bees of winter physiology that have been around since last fall. But this passing of the torch of the old bees to the new bees is really crucial. Because if these old bees die off before the queen has the ability to raise up this new spring brood, then your colony is going to go into spring or come out of winter very weak in population. So let me get into some March tips that I think will help make this transition more successful for your bees and you as a beekeeper. To make this transition more smooth, you really need to feed your bees. Find any method that works for you and where you live. Some of you in the far south or the far west, you're getting your spring a little bit earlier than we are here in the midsection of the U.S. And so your feeding options may vary. But here for me, I'm going to start feeding some community feeders. But the main thing I'm going to do now, take off the winter, be kind. I really don't need it anymore. And I'm going to go to a top feeder because I need to feed my bees from the top. So start feeding your bees. Now let me walk you through how to make this transition from the winter bee kind over to the top feeder. This is the third one I've placed on this hive. They've eaten three or two completely, which is about five pounds, four or five pounds a piece. And now they're on the third one. But since they're flying and wanting to forage, I can tell they're not gonna be as uh, on this as much as they normally are. Okay, so they're kind of off of it and just sitting there on the top, the top part of the winter cluster. <laughs> That's so cool. All right, so here goes this Burns feeding system that I invented. And right here is right above their cluster. They're all just sitting right there like, feed us, David. We want some of that good nectar that you make with the amino B booster. Amino acid is protein and there's other uh, protein powder we've added. And of course the honey be healthy. You put it on like that. And why I'm putting this on, it provides a shell to add support protection of my feed that's inside of here. So in other words, now when I open this lid up, because my burns feeding systems, they have screen under on the under underside of this hole the bees are able to put their proboscis up through the screen and drink the sugar water um, now i can change it just by taking the top off and never get stung like an entrance feeder you take it off and the bees are on the entrance feeder but as you can see here when i remove this they're below the screen oh and they're already starting to eat it like crazy that's so good and then after that i'm going to put my top cover on you don't want to leave your winter bee kind out here. Forget about it, because if you do, it could induce robbing. And then I'm going to take a big uh, cinder block and put right here to hold it all down. Now, some of you may notice that the bees are used to going in and out of where the winter bee kind opening was during the winter, which they take potty breaks on warmer days in the winter. But quickly, they will reorientate because they're using their entrance pretty good now and it works out really well. The second thing you wanna do is unwrap your hives. If you have them wrapped up, probably a good time you can unwrap that hive, let some of that good sun hit that box. Now, if you live in the far north and you're still experiencing some brutally cold weather, by all means, keep it wrapped up. But I would say if you start to see some temperatures in the 50s in the daytime, 
Time to take the wrap off. Now we're gonna get into something that is a little bit iffy, but I'm gonna lay it out there for you. Before we get into my next tip, this is my chance to say, please subscribe, please, please, please. Just go down and click on the subscribe button. I would appreciate it so much. Give me a thumbs up. It means a lot that this video will be pushed around YouTube a lot more just by you saying thumbs up, I like it. And click on the bell. That way you'll be notified each time I make a new video. Now, let's get back to the tips. It's time to start thinking about inspecting your colony. Now, to inspect your hive that has made it through the winter, you really need a temperature of about 65 degrees, and it needs to be a pretty nice day outside. Don't go out there if it's cold. You don't want to chill your brood, especially kept over brood. So let's walk through an inspection coming out of winter. What are you looking for? What can you do? Now, don't go out to the hive empty-handed. I have an inspection guide that I really want to see in your hands. It's a PDF file that you can purchase and download uh, from my website, and then you can print it off, take it out there with you, because it will walk you through and allow you to mark off how many frames of eggs you see, how many frames of pupae, how many frames of honey, of nectar, just allow you to really not get caught up in the inspection where you don't remember what you looked at unless you have, would have taken some notes. So we wanna go into that hive prepared to really document what we're seeing. I'll leave a link down below. So the first thing you wanna take a look at is what kind of brood do you have? Where is the brood? Is the queen laying well? That's the first thing to look at during this inspection. You wanna kind of look around, see if you can see eggs. How many frames of eggs are you seeing? Do you see larvae? How, how many frames of larvae? How much larvae is in your future? And of course, capped over brood is easier to find. It's a little bit larger and more obvious. So look for frames of capped over brood and see what things look like. This will allow you to assess what the size of your colony is, how big it is. Don't try to assess your colony's population or strength by merely looking at adult bees. That can be really deceiving. For example, if you see a whole bunch of bees and you say, oh, my colony is just full of bees, but there's no queen and no brood, your colony only has about a month left before they all perish. So you've got to look at upcoming brood to determine the future size of your colony. Now, while you're doing your inspection, another thing that you want to keep looking for right now, and especially those of you in the south and further west where it's been warmer already, is you want to check for swarm cells. Um, we're gonna start experiencing swarms now that it's getting closer to spring. So all of you need to be concerned about that. Congratulations on getting your bees through winter, but uh-oh, they're probably gonna wanna swarm. And if you don't wanna lose half your colony, maybe you wanna do some honey production or make some splits, then you wanna keep them all together. So inspect your colony, start looking for any signs of swarm cell development. But along these lines, you know, before they start raising queens, the colony will raise drones first, the male bee. So start looking when you do your inspections to see if you see any drones in there. Uh, generally speaking, a mature drone before it can mate with a virgin queen has to be about 10 to 16 days old after it emerges from his cell. But you can start looking at your drones and making that determination if you're having drones. So if you see drones, that means that spring is nearby. It's a good sign, but you still have to control swarming. So you need to be looking for swarm cells. I've got future videos coming up and I'll help you walk you along what you do if you start seeing that your hive is showing signs of swarming. By the way, this is a good time for me, even though I have more tips that I'm gonna share with you, it's a good time for me to say, please do not use my video channel here on YouTube to give you all the information you need to be a successful beekeeper. I don't believe that you can become all the beekeeper that you need to be by watching different clips, in this case, seasonal tips. I think you really need to take a beekeeping class. Classes are near you where you live, either a bee club or a university, or I have beekeeping classes online if you don't want to travel somewhere. I'll leave links down below. I really have a good class for you to take. It's called Spring Management. This is online. 
You can take it at your convenience. You're not going to ever lose it. It's not a Zoom meeting. It's just like, like this, me teaching you a more thorough approach to what to do with your bees in spring. It is paramount on this next tip that you really learn to do a mite inspection. Mites really are the main reason bees fail. They're the main reason that bees perish and die and don't produce honey like you want them to or don't produce population, they don't grow like they should, or they just totally die out. Either in summer or fall, sometimes in the winter from mites, it's really depressing. Now, mites are one of those things that a lot of beekeepers think that we should just be chemical free, don't do anything with mites, let the bees learn how to deal with mites on their own. You know what, if we lived in a perfect world or a deserted island somewhere, I think that might be possible, but the way beekeeping is done in the US particularly, it is a lost cause for us ever to try to be uh, hands off with mites. It's not gonna go well. It might go well for a year or two at the most three, but eventually your bees will succumb to the pressures of mites spreading viruses throughout that hive. So in the spring, as soon as you can, let's do a mite test. Now, a lot of people ask me, uh, it, can I do a powdered sugar test? Is an alcohol wash more effective? I really feel that an alcohol wash is gonna be uh, able to produce a more accurate amount of mites that you have in your colony. But as I've always said, not, all, not everybody wants to kill 300 bees, so an alternative approach is to use a powdered sugar shake and do a test like that. Again, that's why it's so important that you take a class that it teach you thoroughly how to do this mite inspection. You have to start controlling mites as soon as you can. Coming out of winter, if you've got large populations, you're gonna have a lot of mites. And before you make splits, making one hive into two hives, you don't want to have a mite problem, then you're splitting and now you have two hives that have a mite problem. So you got to do a mite check, get your numbers, uh, well, how many mites you have. We don't want more than three mites per 100 bees on our test. If you come out of winter with hives that are strong and you have a, a good population and you find that you have high mite levels, this is the time now to start your mite management, whether you're going to use green drone comb, whether you're going to use a powdered sugar shake to drop more mites off. Uh, like I've said in many, many videos, those are things that will help. Uh, they, not, they may not always reduce it. In fact, recent studies that I'm going to present to you in the, re, in the near future show that even uh, a solic acid doesn't have the ability that we thought it did to really knock down my populations. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in a future video. So we have to stay with it. We can't do a one-time treatment and then think they're gone forever. Mites are gonna snap back into the hive really quickly being carried in by robbers or drones or our own bees visiting flowers from other colonies that visited that flower and happened to drop off a mite and now our bee picked it up. Might spread rapidly as a parasite inside that colony. So it's something that you have to start managing immediately or you will cry. Two more tips I wanna share with you while you're inspecting this colony on a nice warm spring day. <laughs> you wanna to get to the bottom board by moving boxes off so you clean that up. You wanna find out if there's a bunch of dead bees on the bottom board and then you wanna get them all out of there. Now your bees could hopefully naturally clean out the dead bees on the bottom, but let's give them a little bit of a head start and do a little house cleaning down there ourselves. And then finally, if you live in a climate where it's warm enough to make a split, you need to manage your colony so you won't lose it. You need to do a split so that your colony doesn't fly, half of it doesn't fly away. Now immediately all of you are probably wondering, oh, 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 what's the day I'm supposed to do a split? What is the day on my calendar that I'm supposed to do a split? There's no way I can give you a date. I'm speaking to people all around the world. Some people are going through summer, some are going through winter, some are going through spring and fall. I can't give a date, but I can tell you this. Use the colony to tell you when you should make your split. For example, if they're raising drones and if you start to realize there's nectar out there, there's a source of some kind of incoming pollen, dandelions is my indication that I need to make splits. If the colony is 
into spring, you need to get ahead of the season that they swarm. Here in Illinois, for me, May is the month that my colonies will swarm. So if I can get out there sometime in late March or April and start making my splits, it really works out pretty well. I do have to watch for these Alberta uh, cold snaps that come in, these Alberta clippers, that if I make a split too early and that split is a very small four frame split, it's gonna be really tough for them to uh, make it through this real cold blast if it gets back down you know, below 20 degrees into the teens or something. That would be a threat to a small split. So use your good judgment by looking at your calendar. Don't let people like me tell you that you have to do it on a certain date or other YouTubers. Don't let them tell you you have to do it on this date. You have to do it by this date. They may be in Texas or Georgia. So, you know, you have to use your own research, your own common sense to say when it's warm enough and temperatures aren't getting below freezing anymore, that's a good time to make a split. The first shout out goes to Nathan Thorne. He says, I've learned so much from you and I want to say that I you. I'm curious about non-hive bee work. That is, what flowers can you grow to make more honey? Well, Nathan, that's a good question. A question that I often get asked. People are always wondering, what should I plant in my yard, in my garden, in my fields to help my bees make more honey? Uh, don't go down that road. Bees fly two or three miles away to get nectar from other sources. And they're gonna go for a very large place, like a, a place where there's over a half acre to many acres of things to forage on. So if you plant a few things in your yard, you'll get some of the younger bees from your hive go out there and pollinate those things. But as far as massively going out and collecting nectar, that's gonna to have to be a lot of acres. If you have that near you, then you could think about where you live and what sorts of things that bees love and you can plant that. For me here in Illinois, I love just Dutch clover. My bees do the best on Dutch clover. Now in Illinois, um, I don't have to really think about planting things. I could plant alfalfa, stuff like that, but I've got a lot of farmers around me that plant that. I just let my bees go out there. I live near some uh, black locust trees and near a river near me. So in the spring, my bees really go out to the black locust and uh, harvest that. So do your little bit of research on your own and find out, you know, do a little Google map research on what's within three miles of you. And maybe you'll find that you really don't need to plant much. But if you really want to, just search what grows in your area really well and then find out if those are things that bees enjoy. So thanks Nathan for being a subscriber. Shout out to you. Our next subscriber is Kathy. Kathy says, hello David. I have enjoyed all the wax products you spoke about in the beginning of the video. That was great old days. I think I enjoyed the wax drink bottles the best. Thanks again for all the info of your videos. Keep them coming when possible. Yeah, I talked about comb honey and how we used to use wax lips and eat wax Coke bottles back in the 60s. <laughs> that resonated with a lot of you that left comments. Well, shout out to you, Kathy. Thanks for being a subscriber. Let's give a shout out and thank you to subscriber Mike Devine. Hey, Mike, thanks a lot for leaving a comment and being a subscriber. Subscriber. Mike says, Hey David, thank you for all your amazing beekeeping educational videos. Your videos make my day. I appreciate that, Mike. And thank you for being a subscriber. Now, if the rest of you are watching and if you want us to highlight your comment as a shout out and a thank you, you got to subscribe. Some of you are brand new beekeepers this year and you're worried about whether you'll have the ability to really inspect your hive uh, with great wisdom and know what to do, know what you're looking at. Let's rest a little bit. I made a video for you. You'll be able to watch this video and know what to look for. I'll show you the difference between brood and a honey frame. I'll show you the difference between a, a drone and a worker. I'll show you the difference between drone brood and worker brood. Take a breath, calm down, and watch this video. Educate yourself so you'll be ready. Thanks for watching. See you next time.